just a little preface. Tonight in our gospel, we heard how Jesus gave an identity to this church that he was giving birth to. An identity to servanthood. An identity of the one who starts at the master, the Lord, gets down on his knees and washes his disciples' feet as an example of who we are to be in the world. And as I was in seminary and I read more and more about Bonhoeffer, the more I became enticed by what he was saying. About how he was concerned about a church who was so wrapped up in nationalism, they almost, well, not almost, quite a few of them forgot what they were called to be. Servants to people. Whether they were Jews, whether they were gypsies, whether they were homosexuals, Baptists, whatever. For Bonhoeffer, being the church, we were called to be servants to all. And so I thought it would be appropriate for tonight to kind of reflect on some of the letters that he exchanged with the close friends of his, Eberhard Betke, who himself was caught up in the Nazi regime, was drafted, was serving as a soldier before he got arrested himself, but during that period of time, he and Bonhoeffer exchanged some letters that spoke deeply, theologically, and relationally of how we are to be identified in Christ. My friend Eberhardt, it was good to hear about you in my parents' letter. They wrote to me and told me that you were drafted and that you were serving and that you were somewhere south of Rome, but you were safe. You weren't caught up in some of the things that I've been caught up with. And so I've pondered these days as I prepared to write the letter, how God has placed us where we should be. How God has placed you among the soldiers where you can take the good news to them and you can serve them. And how God has placed me in this prison where I can live among those who are caught on the wheels of life of this regime as well, and share them the good news, even in a place like Table. And so it is great to hear that you are doing well, and I hope that you will be able to respond to me in correspondence, because there is much that I wish to share with you. Adrian, I can only tell you with words how deep my heart feels for the suffering you go through. Coming back from Italy, I've seen people die, wounded on both sides, and my heart goes out to both sides. I hate death and dying. Here you are in prison. We've got to deal with dying with our own people. We've got to deal with suffering. It seems no end in sight. So I pray for a stronger faith. We must have a stronger faith, no matter what happens, Dietrich. I ask you, since we both have studied Luther and Finkenball, and you had the privilege of going to America on two occasions, but in my studies and in your studies, can we say with Luther that in this world uh, we, ought, we ought to think about death and resurrection on this side of heaven, on this side of heaven, where there seems to be such massive suffering? Uh, what, what do you think, uh, my brother uh, Dietrich, about that? What Luther would say, on this side of heaven, we have to think about the suffering and do what we can. Dear Everhart, I want you to understand that I do not regret at any moment of coming back from America. I could have stayed there. They had many things set up for me to do so. But I felt called to come back to Germany to stand with my brethren in the situation that they are facing. Understanding the Aryan Clause and what it was going to do with the invasion of nationalism into the church, I felt strong to come back. And I know that you hold me responsible for a lot of the suffering that some of my family and some of your friends and my friends are going through. But I felt it was a lesser of two evils. I do not try to justify myself. I have accepted my, my plight, where I am, 
I've accepted where God has placed me. But I also know that suffering is part of this life. The cross faces us, Everhart. It faces us with our Savior hanging on it. It tells us that following in this faith, following who we are identified with, will lead us to suffering. But it doesn't mean we lose our humanity in that suffering. For even in this place, this prison, I have found joy in the gospel. I have been told by the guards that I have a peace that surrounds me almost like an aura. If only they knew what was going on inside as I grovel with them with the brokenness of this world and the possibility of me facing my own death. But I guess that's the spirit moving through me, giving me a sense of peace in the middle of all this suffering. Abraham, Glauba is believed. I can only say we have to, wir müssen beten jeden Tag für einen starken Glauben. Every day we have to pray for a strong belief. Because I don't know, you haven't seen Maria, your fiancée, for, for many months. And the anxiety of, for, for people that you, uh, you guided at Rickenbaum. And, and yet, you know, we have to deal with, with an Antichrist leader. All of this, uh, sometimes uh, I think can be overwhelming, not only for you, but for me. Uh, what did you mean when you say uh, we have to be with Christ in Gethsemane? You mentioned that in one of your letters. What do you really mean by we, we have to be with Christ in Gethsemane uh, again and again? Uh, hasn't that suffering been over? Please explain that to me, uh, my brother. As we face our troubles in this world, as we face the brokenness of this world, it pulls us all into Gethsemane, where we have an opportunity to pick up a sword, where we have an opportunity to follow Jesus. I too struggled, and I picked and, and chose the path of Peter, but I also have been told by my Lord to sheathe that sword and to follow him into the courtyard. Dietrich, you studied under some uh, notable uh, religious leaders, and, and I realize that you have rejected academic theology. Uh, and now you say that we have to be almost foot washers. Uh, your experience in Harlem would tell us that, that we have to make ourselves vulnerable uh, and, and to identify with those who are hurting, uh, those on the margins, those who are vulnerable. Do uh, you realize that we will be considered as Almost uh, people will laugh at us and censor us. We <coughs> are simply not very realistic uh, when we talk about a, a word like religion as Christianity. Uh, I always felt we should be like Peter, and strong and willing to take on the enemy. Now, here you're talking about uh, uh, being a foot washer almost. Uh, sometimes, uh, I want to be clear on this, because uh, I'm a, a loving brother, I hope, but, but give me a, a, a not better understanding of what you mean about religion as Christianity when we deal with all this, this power of us and struggles. Can you help me here, Dietrich? Was not the first century church immersed in the power of the empire? And were they not mocked? Were not, they not considered as weak? The word Christian itself was a derogatory response. You are Christ-like. You are weak like that Jesus who we hung on the cross who we easily stepped on like a ant. It was the words that the first century church heard, the second century, into the third century. They heard that they were weak. But it was during those three centuries that they continued to grow, grow in that weakness, because within that weakness, within that suffering, they were able to fall back and rely on the power of the cross. The power of Jesus' promise of resurrection. The promise of Jesus leading us into righteousness, into right relationships. And my friend Everhart, the one thing that prison does afford me is much time for study. There's not much more to do. And I've known, noticed that as I continued my study, word studies in the Old Testament, I've come to realize that righteousness is so important in the Old Testament. Right relationship. How you think of others. I've come to realize that salvation 
holds very little weight in the Old Testament. The word is not that important for human beings. It is God's reign. It is God's area. It is God's call. It is God's elect. And the only thing that the Israelites could do was live out that righteousness, those right relationships that God afforded them. That's what the prophets railed against. The prophets came and reminded them again and again and again that God did not want their sacrifices. In fact, it became a stench to his nostrils. What he wanted them to do was to go back down from the temple to live rightly with the poor, with their slaves, with the widows, with the orphans, to give them an opportunity for life. That was done outside of religion, outside of confession, just as Jesus lived that as well with the centurion, who he said his faith was greater than any that he found in Israel. For the woman who broke the alabaster jar to anoint his feet, to Zacchaeus who was up a tree, to the eunuch who was on the road with Philip, to the Gentiles, to the women. It was not based on religion, but it was based on righteousness. In fact, the disciples, when they sat be before the Sanhedrin, they did not even use Jesus' name. They said, the righteous one whom you had crucified. One brother, we pray for one another. Now we're all in the jail, we are by ourselves, and I'm so grateful you can convert to guards like Paul and Silas did. But our people have died last night in, in, a, in an air raid, and they'll die tonight. And uh, there's any, there's an, uh, uh, any question about what will happen to, to this, our nation, our families, as this war comes to a close. Already there are indications of unconditional surrender. Terrible things can happen to us. And sometimes I wonder, in all honesty, as we are in prison together, I say to our Lord, isn't there another way? Even Jesus said, can there be another way? God can do all things. Why must we go through their suffering? Uh, uh, can I ask you that? Uh, now we're brothers, we're both pastors. But can God do everything? Couldn't he give us another way by which we can release our people from this demagoguery and tyranny? And somehow uh, have the other people recognize that there are Christians here. Because we're dealing with demonism on many fronts. My brother, serving Christ as I have. Sometimes I have these honest questions too. Teacher, can you help me? Can you help me as I suffer with my own people here? Can God release us and give us another way so we don't have to go through this suffering to the end? To bit an end. Can you help me, my brother? You're in jail. I'm still out of jail, but I could go in at any time. My friend Abelhart, you said, can't God do all things? But didn't he do all things through the cross? By taking on bone and flesh, by taking our blood that pulsated through his veins, did he not do everything from the cross? Did he not empty himself and show us what service was about? Did he not cry from the cross, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing? Did he not join us in the very brokenness that we have created? And out of that brokenness, gives us opportunities and possibilities of living right. I've accepted my lot. I've accepted it willingly. I know that what I've been sentenced is true. I broke the law, and so I am here. Our people must suffer through some things now, too, because the law of righteousness they have broken. They have melded the church to their very country, to the Fuhrer, and now they struggle with the very things that they created. I pray for them. I weep for them. I pray for my family. I weep for them as well. But in all of this brokenness, my faith has become stronger. I know that I am right where I should be. I am never outside of God's hands or God's realm. Because I know that even in the midst of this, 
as we struggle with our identity as the ecclesia, as we struggle how to relate to God without religion, but through righteousness, I know that Jesus still leads on. I want to say this because the guards will be coming here shortly and uh, you might have some of your rations curtailed if we over talk here. But I want to say in one of your letters, uh, uh, you did say that, that we got to manage our lives without God. And for a moment I thought that was uh, heresy, uh, apostasy. Uh, uh, why would uh, uh, you, my dear brother, uh, who know, who knew uh, Finkenbaum, who, who knew the teachers in Berlin and uh, who <coughs> studied uh, the form of concrete better than I, how could you say uh, uh, we have to be a, a people sometimes that live our, our lives without God? You said this in one of your early letters. Do you mind, my brother, if I ask you that? How can you say that? We are to manage our lives not as if we are trying to earn something from God. We are to manage our lives that the most important thing we do is that we live rightly for each other. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, that you love me as I have loved you. And if you do that, he tells his disciples and us, people will know that you are my disciples. Not by going around and mentioning God's word in every sentence that we use, or God's name in every sentence that we use, but going around and living God, because God is in us through Jesus Christ. We are not to manage our lives as if we are trying to earn something from God, because Luther himself told us we cannot do that. And so we manage our lives for our neighbor, for the enemy, for those who are strangers in our midst. And when we do that, we don't manage our lives with God, but we manage our lives in the identity of God. Finally, in one of your last letters, Pastor Dietrich, as your congregation would say to you, you said not to regret if your life is lost, not to mourn your life if it is lost, but to give thanks that your sins in Jesus Christ have been forgiven, and to be thankful for even a short life of 39 years. You said that in your letter. Do you really believe that deep, deep down? I believe that my life is not to be mourned. I believe that life is to be lived. And the life I live, whether it's 39 years or whether it's 89 years, is a life that I can lay my head on the pillow for that last time and say that I've lived it for the Lord whether in prison or as a free man. And if we do that, are we not walking in the footsteps of Jesus as he still leads on? And as the guards are preparing, I want to sing this song as we sang it, thinking about to give us that power beyond the words, the power and transformative power of singing a song. And uh, join with me in your own way, and then we'll have the congregation Join with us, or those people who may hear us later on. Jesu, Jesuoran, auf den Lippen von Unverhohlen nicht verweilen, ihr getreulich nach zu eilen, für uns bei die Hand, bis in Please rise as we continue with our hymn.
Thank you.